How's it going everyone, Taki here. If you've been following the handheld scene for a while, you know that portrait styled handheld releases are very rare, especially when they include a decent processor. The Palky D820 started as a clone of the Retroid Pocket 1 with an underwhelming processor. During the two years that it was stuck in development hell, the device was upgraded to a better processor, which incidentally made it more powerful than the device it clones. In this video, we are going to cover all that you need to know about the latest and most powerful portrait handheld that you can actually receive, the Palkitty A20. The A20 comes with an Amlogic S905D3 CPU with four Cortex A55 cores clocked at 1.9 GHz and a Mali G31 MP2 GPU. We have 2 GB of LPDDR4 RAM, 8 GB of internal storage, a 3000 mAh battery, and a 3.5 inch IPS display with a resolution of 640x480. For connectivity, we have Wi-Fi 5 and Bluetooth 5.0. The entire A20 runs on Android 9. Even though the A20 can be considered a clone of the Retroid Pocket 1, it does have some improvements and unique elements. In this section, we're going to cover the build quality of the A20. Quick overview of the front. We have an arcade layout with an analog stick above the D-pad, six face buttons labeled as XAB and YCD, and home, select, and start on the bottom. The analog stick here is well known, with the only downside being that it doesn't have L3 functionality. I want to focus on these buttons right here. These are using dome switches, which means that you'll hear a clicking sound when you press down on them. To give you an idea of the travel length of these buttons, here's a profile shot of the D-pad. It's subtle, but it works well. The same can be said about the six main input buttons to the right. This is going to be the biggest difference when you compare the A20 to something like the 351V, which uses conductive rubber buttons. On the left side, you'll find volume up, volume down, and a power button with an LED indicator light. This light changes color when the charging cable is plugged in, depending on whether or not you are at a full charge. On the right side, you can see the A20 is split into two sections. The main section houses the controls and battery, while the top half is reserved for the screen. This is a similar layout to the 351V, albeit with a bit less elegance since this is just a standard black shell. The black shell can be a bit of a fingerprint magnet, which is why it would have been nice to see a few other color variations for this device. A major selling point of this device over the RP1 is the fact that it comes with proper L1 and R1 buttons on a small shelf. My only criticism about these buttons and the shelf is that I wish they were a bit wider so more of my finger could fit on the button when I hold this in my hand. Again, these are less elegant compared to the 351V, but still serviceable. Interestingly, this shelf houses the HDMI slot, headphone jack, and a reset button. Unlike the 351V, the area above this shelf does not house the CPU, so you won't have to worry about the combined heat of the screen and processors on your index fingers. More on that later. On the bottom of the A20, you will find the TF card slot, a Type-C charging port, and a mono speaker. It is a shame that we keep having devices made with mono speakers that can emulate systems that support stereo sound, but that's a topic for another video. Here's a recording of the speaker's audio quality. The last thing that I want to cover before talking about the software is the screen on the A20. As you can see, this is not an OCA screen, but it does have some redeeming qualities. For this section, I have three vertical devices with 3.5 inch screens. We have the Retroid Pocket 1 on the left with an OCA IPS screen, the A20 with an IPS screen, and the RG 351V with an OCA IPS screen. I have all of these devices filmed at 100% brightness so you can judge the difference in the maximum brightness values and the color temperature of the screens. The screen in the A20 is probably my favorite of the bunch if we were to remove the OCA benefit in the Retroid Pocket 1 and the RG351V. The lack of OCA is going to mean that you will be able to see a rather large gap between the front screen and the IPS under it. It is also possible for dust to get inside the gap during use or from the factory, but the high brightness value and a good color temperature help balance out these negatives. The front screen is unfortunately not glass, but the retail version has a glass 2.5D screen protector applied to it. I will also mention that this device supports sleep functionality with a single press of the power button, and you should have over 30 hours of standby time in this mode. Now, it's finally time to talk about the software on the A20, and this is going to be a highlight for some people. Like the Retroid Pocket 1, the A20 comes with two different ways that you can use the device. You can use their standard front end with a bunch of games already installed, or you can use standard Android applications. 
The benefit here is how easy it is to switch between the two options. Let's start first by going over the Palkitty box, since that's the default option. As you can see, we have a Pandora's box style menu with a games list on the left side and video snaps on the right. If you navigate to the second section on the top, you can easily switch between different systems that are supported inside this launcher. ROM file names are really bad for the default games since they are translated from Chinese instead of the other way around, but you should be able to determine what the real game is in most cases. By pressing the home button, you can get into the system settings menu. Here you can change the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, brightness, and volume settings. Inside the game settings menu, you can edit the ROMs list and add new games to the system. Just like the Retroid Pocket 1, there is also a shady game market where you can download ROMs from the internet to this launcher. You can download from a list of games, but the issue of ROM names also plays a part here. Unfortunately, the system shows games that you already have installed, so that's another annoyance. I tested this with a few games, and I was able to download them, but the system does not do a good job of giving you a clear understanding of your current progress and how long it will take to complete. I'll also point out that this system has two themes that you can switch between. When you find a game that you want to play, launching it is easy. The issue here is that all games will stretch to 4x3 or 16x9 over HDMI without any option to maintain the original aspect ratio. Most importantly, the Palkitty box supports save states. Depending on the game you're playing, the fast forward feature can also be useful. The Palkitty box does have a search feature, which works well depending on how badly the ROM name was translated. One thing that I want to stress with this system is that it comes with a bunch of fake games. Beyond consuming a bunch of your storage space, these are typically Chinese ROMs that won't be very useful to users outside of China. One big positive for the closed system is that the button mappings are reasonable given the controller layout. Palkitty's developer did a decent job of improving the controller mapping before the release of this project, which is a huge improvement over what they were using several months ago. Thankfully, the provider also made a way to use stock Android. Simply go into the menu of the Palkitty box and you will be able to exit out of the front end to a standard Android launcher. I was sent a device with user debug firmware, which means I have root access over ADB, but I do not know if that's normal. As you can see, Google Play Store doesn't work on this build, so you need to install apps over ADB or by putting apps on your SD card and using the file browser to install them. I would advise you to replace this launcher with another one because it's very limited and it doesn't update with new apps until you do a full reboot. I went ahead and replaced this stock launcher with the ATV launcher and it works well. Now we can verify that the screen is 60 Hz and check the instruction set. This S905 D3 firmware is running in 32-bit mode, so you will not be able to use 64-bit applications. For Geekbench 5, we have a single core score of 144 and a multi-core score of 483. Both of these are a big improvement over the RK3326. For Vulkan, we have a score of 334. Now that I have everything configured, let's take a look at gaming performance on this chip. First up, Sega Genesis. Moving on over to SNES. Now check the performance of N64 using Mupin FZ. Coming from the RK3326, this is going to be the first system where you can see the added CPU power going to work. Up next, we have PlayStation 1. Round two.
The screen aspect ratio isn't ideal for it, but the A20 can also play GBA games. Because we're running Android, we can also make full use of the Drastic emulator for the Nintendo DS. Like N64, PSP is another system where you can see the performance improvements over the RK3326 handhelds. Let's finish things off with Dreamcast. Right here. Good job. Can you take me to the Oh, okay. No. Thank me later. Yeah. <laughs> Go that way. As you can see, the performance on this little guy is not that bad. Let's do a teardown to see what it looks like inside. The device that I have here is an engineering board, so it has some ugly elements that should not exist in the retail version. For reference, this is a picture of retail boards, which lack the fly wires that I have. Let's start off by removing the ribbon cable for the LCD so we can get a better look at the passive cooling situation on this board. This is where our processor is, and they put a tiny heat spreader with an adhesive strip on one side over the top of the S905D3 and the RAM chips. With this chip, there are a few things to be aware of. First, the power consumption of the A20 is around 600 milliamps on idle, with the brightness set to 100%. Without running anything, you're looking at 5 hours of battery life. While running games, it's not uncommon for the consumption to go north of 900 milliamps, which will bring your real battery life down to a little over 3 hours. Just like the RK3326, the S905D3 can generate some decent heat that you will be able to feel in your hands while gaming depending on the system that you're emulating. 
More than anything else, the concern here is the proximity of the battery to the heat source. That brings us to the price. The A20 retails for just over $100, which is cheaper than some 3326 based devices that this competes against. I personally would have priced this a bit lower given the current competition in the $100 price range. It has more power than the Retroid Pocket 1 and the RG351V, yet with controls that are not as good as the 351V, and Android software that is not as good or easy to use as the Retro Pocket 1. If you like portrait style handhelds, the A20 is the most powerful device that you can buy that will actually ship to you currently. Looking forward, I hope we get some custom firmware on this device since the S905 D3 has potential. If you have any questions about the A20, leave them down below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Consider showing your support for my work by subscribing to the channel or dropping a like on this video. I'll catch you next time with another review. Happy gaming everyone. Talkie out.